Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. It's been a few weeks since we got a video out, but our weather's been horrible. We finally got a break in between storms, so I headed out to a local museum and found a couple of interesting things. I figured I'd make another video until the weather gets better and I can get back on my road trips. So today we're at the Aerospace Museum of California. It's in Sacramento. I didn't think much of the place. They only had three planes they kept indoors, and the rest were just out in the weather, and they really weren't very well maintained. But I did find a couple interesting airplanes I want to talk about. So let's get this thing started. This is the P-80. It was in pretty clean shape. Very significant aircraft because this was the United States' first jet fighter. Built by Lockheed and Kelly Johnson, the Skunk Works guy, these guys built this thing in 143 days. It saw limited action just before the end of World War II. It was the first operational jet fighter to have the engines buried in the fuselage. The British and the Germans were both flying jet aircraft at the time, but because of limited power with their jet engines, they would use two of them, one on each wing. This is the German Messerschmitt 262, and this is the British Glockster Meteor. You see they both have two engines, one on each wing. However, with advancements made by the British in a much more powerful jet engine, the P-80 was designed for a single fuselage mounted engine using the Halliford H-1B Goblin and a single fuselage mounted engine seemed to be much more effective and was used by nearly all su subsequent aircraft. So the Americans were lacking far behind the British and the Germans in jet aircraft technology. GE was trying to come up with an engine for this thing but it was taking too long. So the guys at Skunk Works were able to talk the British out of one of those Goblin engines. The British engineer that delivered the engine took one look at the P-80 and warned Lockheed that the skin of the intake ducts was too thin, but the Americans just ignored him, put the engine in here, started it up, it sucked all the sheet metal around the intake ducts right into the engine, and that engine ended up being toast. That delayed the first flight until they could talk the English out of the second engine, the only other one in existence. So they redid the intake ducts and got the second engine in there. And they were able to start their test flight program. Their test flight program was a total mess, killing Lockheed's chief engineer on one flight. Another flight killed the top scoring United States World War II ace major Richard Bong. But once they got all the bugs worked out in January of 1946, the F-80 flew nonstop across the U.S. from Long Beach to New York in about 4 hours and 13 minutes at an average speed of 584 miles per hour. So everything seems to be going fine and the Air Force changes the P designation to an F for fighter, so the P-80 now becomes the F-80. The F-80 first saw service in the Korean War and was among the first aircraft to be involved in jet versus jet combat. So the f 80s flying around over Korea thinking it's all special and proud of itself until the MiG-15 shows up, flies circles around it, and starts shooting it down. The problem was the straight wing design they put on it is the same straight wing design they had on piston aircraft back in World War II. MiG-15 used a swept wing design that created way less drag and enabled speeds closer to the speed of sound. So the Americans went back to the drawing board and came up with this sexy little number, the F-86 Sabre. They may look similar, but they're not. The Americans weren't just making cheap knockoff copies of other people's airplane like the Chinese do today. This F-86 shot down over 800 megs and had an 8 to 1 kill ratio. So as the F-80 was phased out in favor of the F-86 Sabre, Lockheed was still not done with their F-80. They reworked the fuselage by stretching it 3 feet and adding a back seat for a flight instructor and it became the T-33 trainer. The T-38 was used to train jet aircraft pilots up until the early 60s when it was replaced by the Cessna T-37 Tweet and the Northrop T-38 Talon. A little fun fact that I find hilarious is in 1974 Chile was still flying the F-80 the same year that America started flying the F-14 Tomcat. Could you imagine that? 
you're in the Chilean Air Force in 1974. You're out on patrol in your F-80, and a Tomcat goes flying past you. <laughs> so I went walking back around, found this C-119 with the door wide open, so I went up inside it. They had a chain up so you couldn't climb into the cockpit, but I was able to get a little video of it. Then I came across this F4. Wasn't in very good shape, but it wasn't too bad, I guess. Came across the F-14. Look at the leading edge on that wing. God, do you think they'd grab a gallon of paint and paint that stuff up? It's all corroded. Oh, and the A-10 Warthog. Everybody loves the Warthog. Got a little bit of footage of that. And this old MiG-21. They had a tarp over it, so you couldn't see inside it. Wasn't in very good shape anyways. So then I came across this old EC-121. This plane might not be as sexy as some of them jet fighters, but it was important to me. I was kind of excited to see it because in my time in the Air Force, I actually was assigned to the plane that replaced this thing, the E-3A. In 1977, I was transferred to Tinker Air Force Base. I was an aircraft maintenance mechanic on E-3 AWACS. The E-3 is actually still in service today, but it's soon to be replaced by the E-7 Wedgetail. So hopefully after the E-3 Century is retired and the E-7 Wedgetail comes into service, we'll start seeing some E-3s in museums also. But for now, let's go back to the EC-121 Warning Star. So the EC-121 was built on a Lockheed Constellation airframe, and if you're an old ab geek like me, you'll definitely recognize this plane with the three vertical stabilizers in the back. This was one of the most successful commercial airliners until the jet age came along. So this big hump on top of the plane and the one underneath here were just full of radar equipment to supplement the ground base radar on the distant early warning line. But look at this bottom one. Good God, this is what I'm talking about. This place could go get a gallon of paint and keep these planes in a little better shape than this, don't you think? So I found a set of stairs going up to get into this thing, but they had the door locked and I couldn't get in. So I walked around a little bit more and then I went inside. I found some pretty cool stuff inside though and it was a lot better shape than this stuff. Inside I found this really nice F-86 Sabre. There wasn't much information on the plaque, but after Googling the tail numbers, I found out that the museum had restored this one themselves. And this is what it looked like when it rolled into the museum before they started working on it. There wasn't much left inside the cockpit at the time, and I think there still probably isn't. It looked to me like it was more just a restoration for a static display, but that's still pretty cool. So I was able to find pictures on the internet of when they started restoring this thing. They sanded it all down. Here's a picture of it after it was sanded before the new paint job. Now how awesome is this? These guys installed three of the six 50 caliber machine guns complete with the ammo back into the side of the plane. Put a piece of plexiglass over this cutout so we could check this out. I've never seen a museum do this before, so I thought this was pretty cool. So as I'm walking up to this plane, I think I'm looking at a Spitfire because of the cockpit canopy. 
but after I got over and looked at it, it had an Allison engine, I decided to do a little more check-in, and apparently the very early P-51s did have this type of canopy. Here's a picture of some of the early P-51s that did have this style of canopy. However, the pilots were complaining they couldn't see behind them. So they switched it up to this bubble style canopy. This is what I'm used to seeing when I look at a picture of a P-51. So it was pretty cool to run into this old P-51. It was in really nice shape too. So then I came across this beautiful F4 painted up in the Blue Angels livery. The Blue Angels flew this thing from about 75 to 86 or something until, and then they transitioned into the F18 Hornet. This museum had a pretty small hangar. They couldn't fit much in here, but what was in here was pretty awesome. So as I'm checking out the rest of the museum, I come across this room full of old airplane engines. They're all restored in perfect looking shape. And I came across this Pratt & Whitney R4360. This thing's a 28 cylinder engine. Thousands of these things were overhauled at McCullen Air Force Base here in Sacramento. That's where the museum's located. They were used in the B-50, the C-97, the B-36, the C-119 boxcar that I showed you earlier, amongst a bunch of other planes. The list goes on and on. Uh, even commercial airliners were using some of these. So this one's a fully assembled engine. These things were huge. Yeah, here's the fully assembled and that partially torn down one side by side. So for any of you aviation freaks out there like me, this, you got to remember the B-36 Peacemaker. All six of them prop engines were turned by this Pratt & Whitney R-4360. Plus four jets, six turning and four burning. How could you forget this guy? So if you were one of the 700 people that actually watched my last video from the Western Antique and Automobile Museum, You'll remember this guy, the old Ford Tri-Motor, the first plane to ever fly a cow. Well, we got the engine that powered this guy here at this museum. This is the Wright J5 Worldwind engine. A nine-cylinder, air-cooled, 200-horsepower engine that not only powered the Ford Tri-Motor, it also was the engine used in the Spirit of St. Louis when Charles Lindbergh did his 1927 New York to Paris flight. Yep, that's the same bright J5 World wind sticking out the front of his plane. I still can't believe he didn't have a window so he could see where he was going. Well, that's going to be about it for this video. If you happen to make it all the way through, well, God bless your little hearts. And for the rest of you that turned it off after a few minutes, well, thanks for trying. Hopefully the weather will get nice and we can get back out and do some road trip videos soon.